So uh, let me introduce first speaker, Dr. Adawa Ahusha Kodua. Dr. Adawa is a new PhD graduate at the School of Nursing, the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. She is an active and researcher focusing on health literacy, dementia care, mental health nursing, and research. She has developed a comprehensive dementia literacy scale as a part of her PhD thesis. She firmly believes the efforts to improve mental health literacy without recourse to addressing social and economic determinants of health may prove better. Adova is an assistant general secretary of AHLA and a council member of Health Literacy Explorers, the International Health Literacy Association. Now, I would like to request Dr. Adova to share an insights on dementia literacy. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Koti, for the introduction. Um, I'll start sharing my screen. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, yes, Ajwa, we can hear you. Okay. Um, can everybody see my screen? Uh, yes, your uh, slide share is on. Okay, all right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, from Hong Kong and probably good morning. I don't know the time schedule in various countries. Uh, my name is Ajo Suokujia and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the School of Nursing at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. And it's a great privilege to present my ideas on dementia literacy at the fourth um, health literacy webinar series. So um, I will start my presentation. The global population is aging, and with aging comes along various age-related diseases, such as um, cardiovascular diseases and neurogenerative diseases like dementia. Currently, dementia, um, there are 50 million cases of dementia globally, and dementia is the seventh leading cause of disability and mortality among persons aged 65 and above. However, despite um, the huge um, um, cases of dementia, literatures have identified that 62% of dementia cases are often undetected due to delay or lack of help seeking for dementia. And due to this, most people with dementia are often subjected to physical abuse, neglect, or even sometimes beaten to their death, as this picture can portray over here. This happened just um, last year in Ghana, where a older adult suffering from dementia was misdiagnosed as suffering from witchcraft and as such she was beaten to death in public. This is a very sad incident that actually attests to the fate of persons suffering from dementia if the symptoms of dementia is unknown or unfamiliar to people around them. Therefore, because of the cognitive impairment often associated with dementia, most dementia patients often rely on their family and friends to acquire and use dementia-related information to make informed decisions about their health and care. Therefore, various literatures have proceeded to improve dementia, um, health literacy of persons suffering from dementia, their caregivers, and the general population at large. Studies on health literacy, actually there are so many studies on health literacy. Health literacy was first defined by Simon in 1974 and since then there have been so many publications about health literacy. Health literacy initially was um, actually referred to as the reading, writing and numeracy skills of an individual. But with advancements in health literacy research, it has actually advanced to critical evaluation and using of health information and resources to navigate the healthcare system. And people often at risk for lower health literacy is older adults, people with low educational levels, racial and ethnic minority groups, and people from lower socioeconomic status. And this also attests to the fact that dementia often is common among older people. There is a need to actually focus on the dementia literacy of older people. And currently, the trend of health literacy research are focusing on improving disease-specific literacy. And a recent systematic review by Key and his colleagues identified that majority of the um, dementia health literacy research are focused on patient education, e-health, REMS, um, physician and patient communication and mental health literacy. However, there is limited studies about dementia literacy. 
For dementia literacy, currently there is no consensus on the definition of dementia literacy, and most studies um, focusing on dementia literacy often refer to the first definition by Law and ANSI in 2009. They define dementia literacy as the knowledge and beliefs about dementia that is the recognition, management, or prevention. Further, after this definition by Law and ANSI, WHO also came up with a new definition for dementia literacy. And from there, various studies have actually come up with different definitions. But to date, there is no consensus on what dementia literacy is about. Therefore, various studies often adopt one definition or the other. And this, in effect, affects how dementia literacy is measured in the literatures. So majority of the studies that I look at often define dementia literacy based on the definition of mental health literacy. However, it's well noted that definition of dementia literacy is often based on the first definition of mental health literacy by John, who defined mental health literacy as the knowledge and beliefs about mental disorders that aid their recognition, management, or prevention. However, there has been improvements in mental health literacy research that look at certain aspects or domains of mental health literacy, talking about how to obtain and maintain positive mental health, understanding of mental disorders and their treatment, reducing stigma related to various mental health disorders, and developing competencies for an individual to be able to assess and seek help for dementia. So I also want to look at the trend of dementia literacy research. For currently, majority of the studies that focus on assessing dementia literacy often focus on knowledge and attitude towards dementia. And there are a few studies that talks about the risk factors and modifiable factors, preferred sources of treatment, and dementia literacy associated with certain health behaviors like preventive health services, willingness to undergo screening tests, and the psychological well-being and caregiving appraisal. However, looking at the trend of these studies, even though um, health literacy and mental health literacy has been researched for a long period of time, research on dementia literacy as this actually started in 2009 by Lowe and ANSI. Therefore, there is scanty literature relating to dementia literacy. And there is, they have seen an improvement after 2017 that new studies are spanning out focusing on dementia literacy. Um, just like I said earlier, due to the definition, um, the lack of consensus on the definition of dementia literacy, most literatures either focus on the measurement of dementia literacy based on how they define it. So majority of the studies that have assessed dementia literacy often focus on using the Alzheimer's disease knowledge skill. The Alzheimer's disease knowledge scale assesses a person's knowledge about the symptoms, diagnosis, dementia care, impact of life, prevention and the risk factors associated with dementia, which are all the physical aspects of dementia knowledge. And there are other studies that also look at dementia attitude skill. They use dementia attitude skill to assess a person's attitude towards dementia. And there are a few studies that have also adopted the dementia knowledge assessment survey. Recently, Doe Hete and um, his colleagues also de um, develop a new skill that's called the CASIDEM. The CASIDEM is a skill that actually assesses um, healthcare providers, patients, and families' ability to assess, appraise, and use dementia information in various um, services. And this skill is just specifically designed for patients, family, and carers, and it cannot be used in the general population. And also consequences associated with dementia literacy. Various studies have looked at the implication of dementia literacy. Adequate possession of adequate dementia literacy is often associated with um, timely diagnosis or help seeking, which also um, leads to access to treatment option, advanced care planning for the patient and their family, and support to family and carers, and also engagement in preventive services. 
However, when individuals possess inadequate dementia literacy, they have been shown to have negative attitude towards persons with dementia, increased hospitalization of the person suffering from dementia. There is also inadequate knowledge about the symptoms associated with dementia, which often leads to neglect and abuse of persons suffering from this condition. And various studies that have looked at um, compared majority um, population with ethnic minority population have identified that racial and ethnic minority groups often have poorer knowledge on dementia literacy than their um, indigenous counterpart. Therefore, we um, from this uh, review, we also identify that there is a lack of consensus on the definition for dementia literacy. And there is a need for a comprehensive skill assessing dementia literacy. As I talked earlier, there are various aspects of dementia literacy that looks at ability to assess and use information to make informed choices, but none of the existing skills have looked at this competency or assess this domain of dementia literacy. And also there is limited study looking at the determinants and correlate of dementia literacy. And most specifically, there is only one study that have actually looked at dementia literacy among racial and ethnic minority groups. And there is the need for more studies focusing on this population group, as studies among this population group have identified that. Among these population, there is a lot of misconception and a lot of um, negative beliefs about dementia that often leads to the abuse and the neglect of these people. Therefore, assessing their level of dementia literacy is very important to actually not just to improve their knowledge, but to also save the lives of persons suffering from the condition. I also advocate for the use of community-based participatory research approach to design interventions to improve dementia literacy. Looking, like I said earlier, dementia literacy often comes with certain contextual beliefs and attitude about dementia. Therefore, involvement of family and caregivers of persons with dementia to identify their information needs and also identify certain beliefs that they have about dementia will provide a holistic approach in addressing issues relating to dementia. And also advocate for the inclusion of dementia training in health professionals curriculum. Because various studies- Sorry for interrupt, ma'am. You have two more minutes to thank you. Okay, okay. So I also talk about um, dimensional literacy, the fact that low dimensional literacy is not just among the population, but also studies have identified low dimensional literacy among health professionals. Therefore, there is a need to include dementia training in health professional curricula because dementia, improving dimensional literacy is seen as a very um, so good determinant of the health of person suffering from dementia and that of their family. Thank you so much. So first speaker of today's webinar, Dr. Orlakshmi Chandrasekharan. Dr. Orlakshmi is an accomplished academician, researcher, and educator in the field of public health with expertise in parenting, adolescent behaviors, and community health. With a passion for understanding the dynamics of human behavior and impact on society, Dr. Orlakshmi has dedicated years of research to explore various aspects of public health and community well-being. She is graduated from Government Medical College, University of Mysore, and did her master's in public health from Mahatma Gandhi University, Kotayam, India and PhD in Parenting and its Influence in Adolescent Behaviors, Manipal Academy of Higher Education, Manipal, India. She has worked as a research physician, clinical research coordinator, and as a project manager in MediCompass, Dubai, UAE, and has a great experience as a lecturer, senior grade lecturer, and assistant professor. Currently, Mam is working as an associate professor, Department of Health Policy, Prasanna School of Public Health, Mahe, Manipal, India. Her recent research activities include co-investigator for various funded projects and principal investigator for youth experiences during COVID-19 pandemic, parenting and its influence on adolescent behaviors and mental health literacy. She is awarded as recipient of Best Poster 
awards at international conferences. Dr. Varlakshmi is a dedicated researcher and educator passionate about improving community health and well-being. With a strong commitment to research and profound understanding of public health dynamics, continue to make significant contributions to the field of public health, mentoring and guiding aspiring teachers such through PhD program. Now, I would like to request Dr. War Warlakshmi to share an insights on dementia literacy. Thank you so much. I hope I'm audible. Yes. And my uh, slides, are they showing? Uh, yeah, just wait. Yes, your slides are visible. Thank you. Thank you so much. So very good afternoon from India and uh, good day to the rest of the world. I thank you so much for giving me this opportunity um, to share um, something that's close to my heart, the work that we do, and also some insights from uh, the field where we work. So my hope is to uh, share some of our insights that we have learned from the field here and uh, the kind of work that we would like to continue to do. So uh, we work in the area of mental health and particularly mental health literacy. I'd like to start off with some of the life stories that we have faced, heard of while working on the field. And we find, as my uh, colleague so beautifully put, uh, there's a lot of misinformation and uh, people fear the very thought of having some uh, mental health conditions. So there's stigma involved, there's discrimination involved, and uh, I can uh, um, uh, fairly say that this is quite uh, representative of what happens in the South Asian context because of my interactions with students around us as well, because they share their stories. And what we've uh, heard of is uh, very sad instances where uh, children, young people are denied early uh, detection and treatment of these health conditions, where I know a particular uh, young person who has been uh, held at home, a very well, um, uh, what do you say, privileged home actually, uh, could have had good access, but kept away from uh, seeking the right treatment because the parents were worried about what society would think of uh, because they themselves were very well placed in society. And when this uh, young person, a young male uh, aged around 18 was brought to the rehab center, every activity of daily living had to be taught, like eating and brushing and everything had to be taught at that age because there was someone to provide those kind of services for him at home. But as parents age, we find that um, uh, that dependence and the care that is provided when they are young, that's not possible as they grow older or they may not have uh, the means to do that. And so uh, the burden of mental health can be quite challenging. Um, um, and we find that when we talk of mental health, the things that we see in terms of symptomatology or what people present with, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of uh, determinants that go uh, into the making of these mental health conditions. Um, the And there are uh, 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 several spheres of influence that all of us go through. Mental health is an indelible part of who we are. And yet there is so much of mystery and uh, so much of fear associated with uh, what these mental health conditions uh, entail. And if we look at the global statistics, as my colleague uh, just shared, we find that one in four people somewhere around the world need some kind of mental health help. Um, that's over one billion people. And when we look at the South Asian context, we find that um, uh, conditions like depression, anxiety, they are on the rise. And a recent um, systematic review showed that uh, there's about a quarter of the people that they included in their study were showing depression and anxiety symptoms. And more than 80% of the people that have mental health conditions and don't have access to the right kind of services, they are in the uh, lower and middle income countries. And when we talk of the spheres of influence, you have um, the micro system, which is the family, the school system, and you know the people that have a very immediate uh, influence on the lives of the people, uh, as, as on an individual's developing psyche. These individuals, um, um, the early life experiences, these also play a very important role, and they can both be protective. They could also uh, turn out to be risk factors. For example, families that are very positive in their um, approach to 
child rearing versus a family that uh, doesn't have the right means or they are um, uh, not functioning very well. So those kind of influences bear, uh, can have long term bearing on the person's development. So it could be the school system and going out of the micro system. You have the meso system, you have the macro system. All of these can have influences and um, this is one of the uh, definitions that uh, uh, we started work with on mental health literacy. This was by uh, Dr. Anthony Shom from Australia, and he talked about how the knowledge and the beliefs that we have about mental health disorders, these uh, are the ones that aid in you know, how we recognize, manage, or even prevent these conditions. And we reached out to um, uh, Dr. Shom's team. We were very keen to understand their work because they were doing a lot of work in Australia. They were working even in India, in rural Bangalore. So we wanted to know a little bit more. We did get uh, connected with them. And some of the things we saw was um, looking at the literature in our own context here in India as well, that there is a lack of awareness on mental health issues. There are a lot of cultural beliefs. There's stigma, there's discrimination, and um, even access to healthcare services are limited. So we went out to do some of our own um, searching on the field. And what we found was quite interesting. I'd like to share some of these things. One of the first studies that we did was with these case vignettes that we um, uh, that Dr. Jom's team shared with us. And um, uh, this was little stories that we had which depicted mental health conditions, uh, common things like anxiety, depression, uh, grief, uh, you know, even those things. So here's one story of vignette about a young girl uh, named Mina. We, of course, modified this to fit our local context. And we went to the schools here, the colleges here. Um, we went to uh, late adolescents aged about um, um, 17 to 18 years and we wanted to know what they understood in terms of mental health conditions because we find that during the window period of about 14 to 25 a lot of mental health issues make their first appearance that's where the first episode start and so here's the story of a young girl a uh, 15 year old who's having some depression symptoms and um, we wanted to know what they understood from these symptoms did they even think of it as abnormal or were they were they thinking that these were common things they saw among their friends. And if they sought help, who would they go to? Uh, would they be comfortable going to a mental health practitioner? Who would, would it who would it be that they sought help from? Here's another vignette where uh, we have this 15 year old boy named Ram who's showing symptoms which are uh, depicting psychotic symptoms. So clearly there's a big difference between the previous vignette and this where there is hallucinations, auditory, visual and those kind of things. And we wanted to see, I mean, what did the um, the these participants of us, what would they pick up on that? And it's very interesting the kind of uh, findings we had. So the first vignette which talked about depression, we found that around 29 percent of them were able to pick up that this was depression, which is quite interesting for us. Um, Although there were other things uh, you find that some of them called it stress, some of them call it mental illness, some of them call it as psychological, mental or an emotional problem. So more than 50 percent of them were able to pick out that there's something not OK. When we went to the next vignette that's of Ram, that was of schizophrenia. Again, we found that there is some inkling of, you know, this is not normal. A lot of them, more than 50 percent said, yes, there is something not OK. But one of the things that concerned us was that about nine to 10 percent of all participants who felt that there was no problem, even with the uh, second vignette. And that was a bit of concern for us. So we wanted to learn a little bit more. And um, the second part of the question that we asked on on these vignettes was if uh, Mina was your friend, what should she do and who should she go to seek help? Should she even go to help, uh, seek help? So it's interesting, again, our findings that we found and we find that uh, around 21 percent said she should go speak to her mother and then you have 16 percent that said she should go to a doctor or a counselor, 8 percent. Then you have a psychologist, about 20 percent. Then you compare it to the next part of the question where it says if Mina were you, you are Mina, Mina and you are experiencing some of those symptoms, would you uh, seek help? And you find a shift. You find that around 31 percent said, OK, I'm going to speak to my mother. And then you see a drastic reduction in the number of people that would seek help from health professionals. So your 16 percent, you know, earlier who said that, uh, you know, you would go to a doctor, it came down to 8 percent. Then you uh, saw that those who would go to the uh, counselor came down to 3 percent, uh, 3.38 percent. And for the psychologist was very less. I think even the term psychologist, psychiatrist, these things are, you know, something that's not very comfortable uh, for people in society, even young people. And we found that came down to around 7%. And the number of people that said they don't need help, if Mina was my friend, she doesn't need help, that was around 16%. But when you see 
if I was Mina and I would not seek help, that went up to 31%. So in some ways, this depicted the kind of stigma that people feel in seeking health care for uh, uh, possible mental health conditions. We saw similar things with Ram's case as well, which is depicted below. And we went on to do another research study because we understood that um, uh, you know, the, in, in the school setting, when we're talking about adolescents and uh, when we're talking about uh, um, um, uh, adolescents spending most of their day in the school setting, it's the teachers that have the uh, you know, um, opportunities to pick up those uh, health conditions. We find that um, um, uh, we wanted to know actually what is it that the teachers were able to identify? Were they able to provide referrals? So uh, this second study was funded by the Indian Council of Medical Research, and we went on to assess the mental health literacy and the referral practices of uh, uh, adolescents by teachers in high schools. We also developed an intervention module based on our findings. This was a qualitative and quantitative study, and also we wanted to test whether that module was effective or not. And um, findings again, um, they threw a lot of light on exactly what was happening with the teachers. Um, uh, the ability to identify anxiety was around 29% less than optimal, and the ability to identify depression again was around 20%, 20.7%, definitely depicting that mental health literacy was poor. And about half of them did not consider mental health disorders to be real medical conditions. This was very concerning because uh, the prevalent idea is this is an adolescent problem and they would grow out of it. One of the indicators that we understood when during our research was that academic performance was taken as an indicator for referral. If an adolescent suddenly began to withdraw, show some depressive symptoms, uh, but was not showing some overt behavioral changes, they, that child would not get referral immediately because their academic performance was OK. So that was one of the things that the teachers were looking for. And uh, we know this might be one of the deterrents for early uh, treatment seeking. And so help seeking was be, uh, delayed. And so we developed this intervention with the help of uh, mental health professionals, social workers. We developed a, uh, an interventional module and we went back to the teachers and uh, we did an assessment at baseline uh, and at three months and then again at six months. And it was interesting what we found that knowledge, attitudes and beliefs, as well as whether they would refer, what they would do in terms of managing these adolescents, all of this improved. We did see a slight dip at six months compared to the three months, but it only tells us that we need to reiterate these uh, kind of training modules and all of these findings were significant. And as a sub part of this study, uh, we also had uh, uh, some um, uh, qualitative interviews with uh, adolescents, with parents, multiple stakeholders, with mental health professionals. And uh, the the uh, findings were again uh, very much on, you know, the ideas that are prevalent at the community level. We here are some of some verbatim statements. Like, for example, uh, some people feel that if you're mentally strong, you will be able to overcome. It's those who are mentally weak who become victims. There's also a belief that it is fate, something that uh, you cannot do anything about. And it, these are deep rooted beliefs in society. These are actual statements made by participants. And there's denial. We find that when uh, talking to mental health professionals, a lot of them feel even if there is any form of screening that is conducted in a school system or through any any institutional system, parents are not immediately willing to um, you know take it forward. They feel my child is healthy and this is not something that uh, is bothering my child. They don't have a problem, right? So. We also we also found that people have the fear that if the child is put on medications, it's going to be long term. And, uh, you know, this is not only for a child, it's even for people who are, are diagnosed later in life. The fear that these medicines will in some way affect them uh, adversely and they're not sure whether it will really help them. They become dull and they become depressed. These are the kind of things that they speak about. One other big deterrent for seeking help is uh, labeling. We find with the stigma comes labeling, like using words like mad or crazy, and they feel that such labels stick. Um, 
so these are uh, these are the things that uh, that are major barriers for people to come out and seek the kind of help that they need so what they do is they go back and fall back on tradition or they go to these informal caregivers uh, so you have a lot of magical religious practices that are still followed we had a clinician who called us a few months back uh, he's a, a psychiatrist um, in a local hospital here and he was telling telling us you know we need to go figure out why it is that people are still you know in this age and time where you have a lot of information available people still go back uh, to seek help from informal caregivers and then come to us towards the end a big driving factor of course is stigma but uh, we need to see how you know these learnings from the community can help us overcome it for example here there's a there's a parent who says we have this deity in our house and we conduct these pujas these, these pujas are rituals that they do on a yearly basis and they believe that that protects them um and so that that's one of the things they feel that they can it can help them overcome mental health conditions uh, for members in their family mm, however in spite of these kind of uh, belief systems that are still prevalent we find there are there are there is the silver lining we find uh, uh, people who can make a change in society for example this headmaster um, uh, who uh, try to counsel the parents of a particular student and ask them to get into counseling and uh, you know putting it across in a way that would get a buy-in from the parents so that's very important we find that we don't have a lot of counseling services in our schools here there are some private schools that do offer it we had some programs in our government system it's not uh, widely prevalent but um, well-informed uh, people can make a change and interestingly we also found that people uh, who are religious leaders there's a priest in a particular temple who we find a lot of people care taking their loved ones who are probably having some mental health condition behavioral changes to these religious places and the priest there would refer uh, uh, these uh, people to you know go meet somebody in a particular hospital. So you go speak to the doctor there. So these are silver linings. We really feel that you know getting the buy-in from the community, people who uh, who can make a change, uh, it can help from the community level itself. So change makers could be people in the family. They could be from the school. It could be religious groups, professionals. Sorry, uh, sorry, sorry. for interrupting, ma'am. Sorry yes. for interrupting. And two more minutes more. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we have NGOs who are working uh, across India. Uh, of course, there's not a lot of resources through the NGOs, but we do know that in the local areas where they work, they are able to make an impact. We have um, uh, institutions like uh, researchers who are also working in these areas. We have a recent program from our government. Uh, it was instituted on the 10th of October last year. Um, and um, so they introduced this tele manas. Manas means mental health. Again, you have... Uh, it's an acronym for um, uh, this assisted network, which is connecting all states across the country. And so it's a, a telephone line. It's free of cost. You have rehab services, counseling services, all of these available. And to date, um, we have around two and a half lakh people, two and uh, two hundred thousand odd people who have access these services. As I heard in a national conference a couple of days back, uh, organized by our national um, Human Rights Commission. So they we are thinking of you know um, taking mental health to the community. So this is these are some of the activities that can really uh, have people talking about mental health. So we have media activities, CSR activities. So all of these things can help reduce stigma, uh, improve treatment seeking, uh, and support that people can get. Even self help groups that can be brought together to support families. All of these can help improve mental health literacy. So it starts with engaging and then works towards empowerment of people in the community. This is our endeavor as well. So with that, I want to thank you and thank you for your patient listening and also to the organizers for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am, for your enlightening talk on dementia literacy. Now I would like to invite Dr. Carmen Kolnia Tholabing as the moderator for panel discussion. Dr. Carmen is a public health professional with a specialization in epidemiology. She obtained her undergraduate and graduate degrees in public health with a graduate specialization in epidemiology from University of Philippines, Manila. Currently, she is a professor of Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics of Department of University of Philippines, Manila. Her research interests include health information system, health human resources, evaluation of public health programs, 
interventions and health literacy. She designed the web-based national database of human resources for health data collection system of the Department of Health, which generates statistical data on demographic and geographic distribution of healthcare providers in the Philippines. She is a principal investigator of post nationwide health literacy survey and the development and validation of a functional health literacy instrument. Dr. Carmen, as a consultant of Philippine Council for Health Research and Development in its institutional capacity building program, as well as in its research grant program as technical reviewer since 2008. She is currently a member of National Research Council of Philippines and National Ethics Committee. She is also a deputy director of Asia Health Literacy Association country office in the Philippines. Over to you, ma'am. Hey, thank you very much, Ramya Yashri. Good afternoon from the Philippines, uh, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed participants and distinguished speakers. We have now reached an exciting and an interactive segment of our webinar. It's time to open the floor to your questions. Questions that you may have on dementia health literacy and mental health literacy. Uh, before we proceed with the Q&A, let me briefly explain how this Q&A session will work. If you have any question, please raise your hand and kindly wait to be acknowledged. When you are called, you can then unmute your microphone, open your camera, and proceed to ask your question. Alternatively, you can post your question in the chat box and we will read it for you. We will do our best to address as many questions as possible given the time that we have, which is 15 minutes. Just as a reminder, we have two esteemed speakers who are going to answer your questions. That's Dr. Adwakudua, who shared with us insights on advances and future research in dementia health literacy, and Dr. Vakalakshmi, I hope I pronounced it correctly, who discussed mental health literacy. You know, they brought a wealth of knowledge and experience to this discussion. Now, without further ado, let's get started with our first question. Please, please feel free to raise your hand or send in your queries through the chat box and we'll take them one by one. So let me see if we have a uh, raised hand or a question in the chat box. <laughs> Uh huh. Critical for the spaceship. That's too powerful. So these are more of comments. Um, any question? Yes, I do have a comment. A question. Yeah, please. Uh, sorry, I can see everyone. Um. Hello. Good. Morning. Kindly, yeah, yeah, sure. Kindly state your name, and please yep. uh, specify whether the question is directed to Doctor. Uh, Adua or to Dr. Balarakshmi, or it's a question to both of them. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, please, sir. Yeah, yeah. my name is Dr. Sajish, uh, professor at the College of Medicine here, and uh, I am currently in the UAE. My question is for, I mean, thank you for Dr. Adua and uh, for uh, Dr. Varalakshmi for a great presentation. I have a quick question to Dr. Varalakshmi. Now, you talked about uh, the example of uh, Meena. My concern here was, how do you ensure that uh, the the you know the uh, recipient for help uh, reaches the right for uh, reaches the right kind of uh, professional uh, professionals and uh, these uh, professionals have a standard they have had some form of standardized training so that the message or the communication is sent across uniformly, no matter what these patients or what these uh, victims are. So what uh, what we did as part of our research was we we formed a, a team that was willing to um, engage with these adolescents uh, with the liaison of the school teachers that we trained. So when uh, a teacher would identify that there is a behavioral issue with a particular child, we had I think three referrals. And what they did was firstly get in touch with our team. And we had counselors on our team who would uh, engage with the parents and the child and then refer as needed to the mental health professionals. So we did develop a liaison team 
and continued with the follow up for each of these children. This is what we, we did for the three uh, uh, referrals that we received. Okay. So this was a team and, of psychiatrists, psychologists. Yeah. Yeah. Trained people. And, trained uh, yeah, and, uh, Dr. Varlashmi, my, I mean, the question, I mean, the, thank you for that response. Um, it's brilliant. But the only concern, the only, uh, you know, uh, worry that I have is that is there any standardization across, you know, because for case one and case two, would we have any, any, any standardization is my question. Because what we uh, found, we find in our practice here is there is lack of standardization. And you yes. know the responses vary among yeah, and the practices yes. vary. Yes. Yeah. It does. Uh, so it, uh, give it. Sorry, sir. Sorry. Please go ahead. No, I, I just want you to shed some light on it. Thank you. Uh, so uh, this uh, the entire project was done um, uh, with the with the uh, expertise of this clinical psychologists and psychiatrists. We had them on our team, and the development of the tool. Uh, starting from that very, very that that particular point itself, their input was sought with the vetting of the tool and you know how we grade, uh, how do we identify that the teachers are answering uh, to this particular vignette, whether they are answering it right. We had multiple questions to identify with, you know, what was their what was their actual perception regarding each of these. Uh, as you said, there is no particular way to standardize it, but uh, with the team that we worked, we were able to bring in the pool of expertise that we could. And sure. that's how we were able to provide the right kind of referral, I believe, for the participants who reached out to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, thank, thank you, you very much, Doctor, for that very informative response. Now let's move on to our next question. Any question from our audience? Okay, while waiting for the next question, can I ask Dr. Adwa? Dr. Adwa, you mentioned about dementia health literacy and that uh, dementia, dementia is a disease that is recognized late and a lot of cases are unrecognized and so they receive care at a later time um, and that they are subjected to neglect and abuse. Um, my question is what specific result of your health literacy uh, study or the level of health literacy of the population um, can provide um, specific measures to reduce or to address the problem of stigma attached to the disease and uh, so that people can, you know, it, it's uh, avail of healthcare services on time or promptly. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question, and I think um, that's one of the main concern of um, dementia literacy research. And so currently, um, I think somebody made a comment, dementia and uh, mental health issue are social construct. So most people actually, um, the society defined how people react and treat persons suffering from dementia. So various interventions have been in place actually to look um, improve the dementia literacy, but mostly they focus on the carers or the caregivers, neglecting the society at large or the public health literacy. My PhD study focused on um, looking at dementia literacy among African migrants living in Hong Kong. So the mm -hmm. find it was a mixed method study. Um, from the qualitative component, some said, oh, I've learned about dementia in Hong Kong, but if I'm still in Hong Kong, I will seek help for dementia. But because of the societal stigma attached to dementia back home in their various countries, they will not do the same approach. They will not seek help because they don't want their family to be stigmatized or people to maltreat them or discriminate against their family. So this actually attests to the fact of the social construct. So Intervention targeting um, dementia literacy should actually look at population level intervention and not just population level, but incorporating um, addressing issues like the cultural beliefs, cultural misconception, desensitizing issues relating to dementia. So if we target only the family members, I think the effort will be limited and there will still be that societal stigma 
relating to the condition because most people have the condition in their family and they are not even aware of. So if you are targeting family members alone, we may not even reach the larger masses of people who are able to actually get or gain access to dementia care and treatment. And one other aspect other um, researchers are looking at is about eliminating um, the mental health factor associated with dementia. In certain countries, dementia is regarded as a medical condition. In other countries, like where I'm from, Ghana, mostly dementia is being treated by psychiatric hospital. And psychiatric care in dementia is attached with a lot of stigma. So people are um, advocating for dementia issues being pushed to the medical sector. And I think that alone will not help because then we are talking about the mental health issue in general. So um, I think a holistic approach actually looking at the population base and also um, addressing certain cultural issue involvement of community leaders because they form an integral part of the caregiving for persons with dementia. Just like in um, Dr. Um, Chandra said, in Ghana, most people also prefer to seek help from religious leaders and from traditional herbalist on um, medical care. So involvement of these people in um, interventions, involvement of the population at night, I think will go a long way to address issues of stigma attached to dementia. Okay, thank you, Dr. Adua. Any question from the participants? Any other question? Um, may I ask a question to the speakers? I, and maybe also the I'm Peter Chan from uh, Akhla and also work in, uh, in Taiwan. Uh, this so dementia issue, yeah, dementia issue is very essential, but there's another issue uh, quite popular and getting more attention is uh, bullying. Bullying uh, between young, usually the young generation at school or in their communities. And uh, it starts to merge, but still very prevalent. I'm wondering, do you have any comment regarding this? Because it's not dementia, it's, it's, it's not old age, mostly are young people. And they are, this bully would not would be hidden. You know, they was not be expressed until many, many years later. And it generate traumatic experience for the individual. So I'm just wondering if you have any uh, experience. And usually are not coming to the medical attention. They don't go to the university, hospital, <laughs> until a very late uh, stage. And we need our outsider, non profession to be engaged. So do you have any suggestion? Thank you for taking the question. Dr. Adwa? Ah, okay. Dr. Bala, okay. Bala Lakasmi would like to uh, answer first. Go ahead, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the question. Um, uh, what uh, we recognize it as well as one of the very important uh, precursors at the school level, as I was saying, this microsystem, uh, it also shapes how an individual develops. And uh, so one of the endeavors from our side as a research uh, group is uh, we are doing an intervention at the school level uh, in high schools because we recognize it as very important. We don't have a lot of data on what is the extent of bullying itself. If you take the Indian context, we don't have data even pertaining to that, but it's very important, as you mentioned. And so one of the uh, one of the PhD students was uh, developing this module to go, um, you know, firstly identify the extent of the problem in the schools here. The other thing was to develop a module and integrate it into the school curriculum, which would empower the teachers as well as bystanders. Uh, who probably observe an incident of bullying. This was uh, uh, this was uh, uh, um, shaped so that it becomes part of the narrative. Talk about it. To talk about mental health conditions. Talk about bullying. These things sometimes are not even recognized as issues in our setting. And so that was where we wanted to start off with. Um, uh, so that's one of the things that we did start. And um, the. The discussions about bullying are much slower. As you know, uh, mental health itself is not given um, uh, a lot of importance. Of course, now it is considered part of the NCDs. So hopefully there will be a little bit more emphasis on mental health. Uh, but a lot of work needs to be done. And 
these are small starts, small things that are starting up. We hope it will pick up pace in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Balalaksmi. Um, Dr. Adua, do you want to add to what has okay. been said? Okay. Uh, thanks, Professor Chen, for um, your um, question. I think um, bullying is a very sensitive topic these days, and it's not just um, fiscal bullying, there's also cyber bullying, which is of very common among the adolescents these days. And it's a very sensitive topic, and if we want to address this, we have to address this from a sensitive nature. Because <clears throat> bullying um, not only just affect the individual it also causes a lot of mental distress for them leading to depression sometimes even suicide and it's a very common phenomenon in hong kong so there is a lot of desensitization about dementia uh, bullying in um, hong kong so most um for me i think the best approach to handle issues of bullying is to be able to actually help people to identify symptoms of bullying, symptoms of people who have been bullied because bystanders will be the best approach to it. Sometimes the person being bullied may not want to come up because of fear of worsening his or her state. And um, parents are very busy these days to be able to detect this issue. So it shouldn't be tackled just at the school level, involvement of the parents also in interventions, involvement of other students, desensitizing students, teachers, teaching teachers how to detect when a student is being under bully or to notice how um, to have like, let me say, to be more aware about the symptoms the students are progressing. It could be just a decline in the academic performance. It could be a change in their mood. It could be anything, just little symptoms that they can actually identify to be able to handle these issues effectively. So for me, I think we can take it from that approach. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Barra Latsmi and Dr. Adwa gave us their insights on the best approach to address bullying involving dementia and mental health. Um, we have time for maybe two more questions. I do not see any question in the chat box. Um, if there are raised hands that I do not recognize, you can just please unmute yourself and speak. I'm not sure I'm, if I'm seeing every all the participants in my screen. Oh. Let me ask another question, if there are no other questions from the participants. Um, measuring health literacy, Dr. Adwa, um, dementia health literacy you mentioned uh, is not standardized. There are several, there are few studies, but the instruments used are not standardized. And the instruments used do not cover all the dimensions and domains of health literacy, which are access. Uh, accessing information, understanding information, uh, appraising and applying information. Now, among these instruments that you have reviewed, you presented several of them. Um, can you share with us their performance in terms of their uh, validity and reliability in measuring dementia health literacy? Thank you. Hi, Professor Kamen. Thank you so much um, for your question. Um, so for the current assistance skills for dementia literacy, like I said earlier, it's not been uh, comprehensive because mostly they assess one aspect. So most studies um, aiming to assess dementia literacy use a combination of one or two skills to assess um, dementia literacy. Either they combine the um, dementia attitude skill with that of the dementia knowledge skill. And for the um, psychometric property, each of these skills have good psychometric properties, so um, and they are very reliable. But the only issue with these skills are the comprehensive nature to assess dementia literacy. So most people are limited in when they want to assess dementia. So they assess dementia literacy just based on knowledge alone. And knowledge alone is not a representative of dementia literacy. It goes beyond knowledge and attitude. 
So that's why we are advocating for a comprehensive measure. And I think when we have a definite um, definition for dementia literacy, have good theoretical frameworks as, um, addressing dementia literacy, it will help us to generate a comprehensive skill for dementia literacy. And currently, that's what um, our team is working on to actually develop a comprehensive skill for dementia literacy. Okay, thank you very much. 